Amen. You may be seated. Over the last several weeks, we've been working our way through uh, what is sometimes called the Romans Road. It's uh, kind of the outline of the Apostle Paul's doctrine of redemption and justification by faith that runs from the beginning of the book of Romans all the way through. And uh, honestly, I never would have dreamed <laughs> when we began the series how appropriate it would be for us living in these uncertain times and how important it is for us to reground ourselves in the essential truths of the gospel and the call to bring this good news, these glad tidings, this great joy to all of the world, to every one of our neighbors, to our friends and family members who have either fallen ill or are gripped by anxiousness, here we have the great assurance that our God has a purposeful plan for the salvation of all of us. So as we take a look at this uh, remarkable passage and really survey chapters 9 and 10 of the book of Romans, let's pray that the Lord would settle our hearts, and quicken this, his word, uh, to, um, uh, to our spirits that we might grow in grace and know beyond any shadow of a doubt that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this, your word. Uh, we do pray that you would now open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things in it. For we ask this, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. One of the great mysteries that hangs over the week of Christ's passion is simply, what was it that caused the Passover pilgrims that crowded into the streets and courtyards of Jerusalem to shout Hosanna's and less than five days later, join the crowd in shouting, crucify him. There was almost nothing about the triumphal entry of Christ that was actually triumphal. Jesus was coming through the wilderness road up from Jericho. And so his approach was peculiar and humble. He then made a, a, a detour around the Mount of Olives to Bethany and Bethpage, tiny little villages. He, he did not ride into the city on a war horse, but on the foal of a donkey. And even that was uh, borrowed. Now, almost everything that, that leads up to the triumphal entry seems incredibly humble for the advent of a coming king. The crowd, nevertheless, did their very best to throng around him. And uh, they, they waved palm branches and laid them at his feet and threw down cloaks. Uh, the palm and palm leaves appear again and again throughout the scriptures as, um, as symbols of honor and homage and royal glory. Uh, the palm was used uh, in the carvings in the temple, usually associated with the cherubim, uh, but also with the regal lion and the flower in full bloom. Uh, indeed, uh, the association of the palm with these ideas actually recurs more than three dozen times in the Old Testament. The blessing of the Lord uh, is uh, compared in Numbers chapter 24 as uh, being uh, like palm groves that stretch afar and like uh, gardens beside a river, like aloes that the Lord has planted, like cedar trees beside the waters. So the people begin to, to wave they're palm branches. In the ancient world, palm branches were oftentimes uh, uh, 
strewn and carried in uh, triumphal processions uh, for conquering heroes or for the coronation parades of kings and princes. All of the Gospels report that the people gave Jesus the kingly honor of strewing these palm branches along the path during his triumphal entry. In the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we're told that they also laid down their garments with uh, cut palm rushes on the street, uh, which was a traditional honorific for kings, according to 2 Kings chapter 9. Uh, John is more specific. He, he mentions the full palm fronds, and the whole Palm Sunday uh, spectacle then uh, was, in a sense, a pointed fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies of the coming of the king in Zechariah chapter 9 and Isaiah 62. They even sang choruses, joyous hosannas from Psalm 118, which was the benediction song for the Passover meal and foreshadowed the passion that Jesus would suffer in the coming week. Psalm 118 is incredibly beautiful. It's filled with uh, very recognizable and beloved passages. Uh, verse 1, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Uh, verses 8 and 9, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It's better to take a refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Verse 22, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Verse 23, this is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Verse 26, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 29, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his steadfast love endures forever. This is the song that the pilgrims sang as the Lord Jesus passed by on his borrowed donkey. But of course, there was already discontent. This humble entry, far from triumphal, that seemed altogether out of sorts with what, say, the zealots were looking for. Uh, they wanted a Qumran-like revolutionary. Or the Pharisees, who probably wanted something like a, a Maccabean purist. Or the Sadducees, who would have been altogether satisfied uh, with a Herodian elitist. J.I. Packer uh, says of this whole scene, everyone who lined the streets of Jerusalem that day so long ago had a different reason for waving those palms. Some were political activists. They'd heard Jesus had supernatural power and they wanted him to use it to free them from Roman rule. Others had loved ones who were sick or dying. They, they waved branches hoping for physical healing. Some were onlookers, merely looking for something to do, uh, while still others were genuine followers who wished Jesus would establish himself as an earthly king. Jesus was the only one in the parade who knew why he was going to Jerusalem. He was going to die. He had a mission while everyone else had an agenda. In Romans chapters 9 and 10, the Apostle Paul tells us that there's something else uh, besides the fact that the zealots were disappointed that they didn't have a revolutionary, and besides the fact that the Pharisees were disappointed uh, that they did not have a Maccabean purist, besides the fact that the Sadducees were disappointed that they didn't have 
an, an elitist of the Herodian line, uh, Paul tells us that there was a deeper problem. It, it wasn't sociological. It wasn't political. Rather, it was theological. In chapter 9, in verse 2, Paul expresses deep sorrow and unceasing anguish of heart for his kinsmen. He says in verses 4 and 5, he, he has this anguish because his kinsmen have been afforded every advantage. They are Israelites, and to them belong adoption and glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, righteous worship, that they have received the promises, the prophets, the patriarchs, and even Christ himself came to them. But then he says, it's, it's not as if the word of God has failed. Instead, he says in verses uh, 6 through 13, uh, there's something else at work here. He says, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are the children of Abraham who were born of Abraham. That's why... That Jesus could, during the triumphal entry, actually turn to some of his critics who were complaining and say to them, if this crowd was silent, God could raise up children of Abraham from the rocks and stones themselves, and they would cry out. Uh, Paul then uh, points to the living examples of this principle that uh, not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. He uses the examples of, of Isaac and Ishmael and of Jacob and of Esau. Now, not many have looked at Romans chapter 9 as essentially an argument for election, for predestination, and the doctrines most assuredly are there. But that's not Paul's primary point. What he wants to get at is why have those who have received every advantage from God, why is it that some still refuse to believe? And so he says in verses 30 through 33 of chapter 9, the problem was is that these... Um, these men, these women, these children, they have pursued righteousness by law and by works. In fact, he says at the beginning of chapter 10 in verses 1 through 5, they're full of zeal. But it's a zeal to establish their own righteousness on their own by their merit, by their works, by their attainments. From the beginning, the Apostle Paul has argued that that's impossible. It's impossible because every single one of us is dead in our trespasses and sins. Every single one of us is in bondage to sin and death. Every single one of us is enslaved to wickedness and to the flesh. Every single one of us is helpless. The Romans' road is a constant repetition of this notion that on our own, we have no hope whatsoever. We if we are going to live, we, if we are going to, uh, to have redemption, must be rescued by something greater than ourselves, uh, by one who can do what we simply cannot do. That's Paul's argument right from the beginning. It's the argument of justification by faith and by faith alone. It's the heart of the gospel. 
And, and so uh, Paul argues in Romans chapter 1, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Romans chapter 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. But we are being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. He goes on and he says, a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Romans chapter 4. If Abraham was justified by works, he, he might have something to boast about. But what does Scripture say? He believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Uh, to the one who believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Now, having been justified by faith, Paul says in Romans chapter 5, that we now have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is what Paul is talking about in the book of Galatians when he says man is not justified by the works of the law. Uh, Paul is saying here in Romans chapter 10, no matter how zealous we are in the pursuit of our own righteousness, we will always fall short. So what's the purpose of the law? Well, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 3, indeed the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. The, the, the whole point that the Apostle Paul is making is that he has anguish for his kinsmen because they have a zeal for righteousness. They want to do right, but they want to do right according to their own strength. They want it to be their righteousness. Christ has come to answer the condemnation, the loud thunder of the law, with grace. In verses 9 through 12, we're told that this grace comes to us in an extraordinary fashion. It's, um, it's a redemption that is a, accompanied by an inestimable treasure. Believe in the finished work of Christ, crucified as our substitute, raised on the third day, and we receive... Salvation, verse 9. Justification, verse 10. We will never be put to shame, verse 11. There will be no distinctions among us, uh, verse 12. And because of the riches of his grace, he will bestow riches upon us as his heirs, verse 12. And summing up the whole argument in verse 13, Paul says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I love the way the King James puts it. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Thomas Chalmers says of this passage, Whosoever? Whosoever? Whosoever shall call upon the name shall be saved. What a scandal this is. Shall the wicked so be saved? And what of the profligate and the profane? Or of the scurrilous and the malicious, uh, the sordid and the unseemly? What of the backslider? Whosoever? How might this be meet and proper? No wonder the religious chafe at the very notion of grace. It is an insult to propriety. But this wondrous word, whosoever, offers hope for the likes of sinners like me. This is the glory of the gospel. It is a call 
to whosoever. No matter how scandalous our past has been, no matter how rocky and uh, circuitous our route to Christ and in Christ has been, his redemption depends upon him and not upon us. This is Paul's whole argument. And so he says, uh, this is why the Great Commission is such an incredible privilege. Listen to this chain of events. He says um, in verse 14, but how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring Good news. Throw that in reverse, and you see the the, the real trajectory of the Great Commission. That we are sent. We are to proclaim so that our neighbors may hear and believe and receive the great call and be saved. Uh, that, that, that passage from Isaiah 52 is, is one that should apply to all of us. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You've seen it, haven't you? On social media during these days of lockdown, some people are panicked, some people are angry, Some people are skeptical. Uh, Some people are spreading conspiracy theories and fake news about uh, raids on Oprah's house. But what people need to hear is this great and glorious good news. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. When we look at this uh, whole story, uh, uh, Paul's theological explanation of how it is that, uh, that the most religious among us chafe at the idea of grace, the, the, the whole story of the five days between Hosannas and crucify him, we're reminded of a, a, a number of truths. Now we're reminded of the great contrast that exists between what the world wants and what Jesus offers. That we're reminded of our own mixed motives whenever we come to worship. I mean, truth be told, we're just, we're just like those people that Packer described, the Zealots, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. We've all got a plan for Jesus to follow in our lives. That we, we have mixed motives when we do the best things that we do. And Jesus came for the likes of us. We're flawed in our worship. We're flawed in our praying. And the gospel is sufficient for flawed sinners, flawed Christians like us. It's a reminder to us that when we are at our best, We're still at our worst. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so, in a sense, uh, what Palm Sunday reminds us of is the necessity of repenting even of our flawed repentance. (laughs) It's a reminder to us that even as we're waving the palm branches and uh, shouting hosannas, We're we're sinners in the need of this great gospel of grace that we need to hear all over again, whosoever. And uh, we need to be reminded all over again of why it is that God has called the likes of us to be the ones to proclaim good news. Because we know it. We know how flawed we are. We know how far we fall short. Who better 
to tell our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones uh, of the great hope that there is in Jesus Christ, but broken people just like us. That's the genius of the Great Commission. That's the genius of the Romans road. It's suitable for sinners like us. This is precisely why Jesus came. Notice, now on Palm Sunday, he did not rebuke the crowd's mixed motives. But he received the Hosannas in the same way that he receives ours today. That's the glory of the gospel. I love this uh, wonderful poem uh, by Henry Vaughan. A blessed, unhappy city, dearly loved, but still unkind. Art this day nothing moved? Now art senseless still? Oh, canst thou sleep? When God himself for thee doth weep, uh, stick nef, uh, stiff necked Jews at your father's breed that serve the calf and not Abram's seed, had not the babes Hosanna cried, the stones had spoke what you denied. Here's the glory of the gospel. It's for the likes of us. And it's for the likes of us to proclaim to others who are like us. And on this Palm Sunday, unprecedented in any of our lives, in the needs, the anxiousness, and the, the frustrations, that message is more apt, more powerful, more needed than ever before. Go forth, brothers and sisters, with the resounding cry of whosoever. And let the world hear. And may your feet be forever beautiful.